in Dropbox. Oh, I have to sign in in order to get to Dropbox, don't I? Yeah. Yes, it does. It's Dropbox. Just okay. Go. It'll, it'll be up on my local drive. Just trust okay. me, as long as I'm connected. Okay, let's try this again. Here's the, the as Dr. Gomez said, the somewhat Victorian subscript to the title on this. And by the way, that's not California, darn it, that's cellular time. Being computer science scientists, we're lazy as heck. And nobody wants to write cellular automata 50,000 times in a given paper. And being computer well, scientists, cool. it is also a pun. Yes, it is a pun. Actually, we wrote a paper with this title. This is from the paper. Okay, the introduction to cellular automata. This was the frame I was looking for. Okay, we've been through this. Birth, this is what was missing from the other one. Birth is a single value. Okay, so when you go look at the neighborhood, we'll talk about this. You're looking for a single value. You're looking for one square, you're looking for four squares, you know, exactly that value, no other value. Death, however, is a range, and it's greater than some value, okay, and the range will go up to however many squares there are in that particular neighborhood. In a uh, radius one neighborhood, there's only eight squares. So death will be some range that starts down low and goes up to eight for a, a radius one neighborhood. Okay, neighborhoods. Remember I told you there were two different kinds. Here's a more neighborhood, which is what we're going to use. It shows the target square in kind of that purpley blue color. And the other one is a von Neumann neighborhood, and yes, that was John von Neumann, which uses those squares that are orthogonal, but not the quarter squares in the more neighborhood. Okay? This gets more fun later. I've got some even better presentations than this. Okay. This shows you what the radius is. The radius is 1 for that radius 1, 1 over there. You can see the label on top and where the arrows are showing you what the distance is. This one over here is a radius 3. If you do the calculations, this is 7 by 7. There's 49 minus the center square, so there's 48 possible values in there. Uh, target square is indicated on both of those. Okay. This is how the neighborhood's calculated, how you calculate for that center square. I have a neighborhood. This was the original pattern here. It was four diagonal squares that forms a diagonal line. I can see exactly one of those squares, which is what this neighborhood rule, what the rules for this cellular automata call for. And so my target square is actually going to be alive in the next iteration. Now, we've moved the neighborhood which is what you do to calculate this thing. I still see the same target square over there. You see a different target square, but you see the same square inside the neighborhood. Now, watch this one. This is moving the neighborhood again. You see the target square there. And because of the way the neighborhood's constructed, what we're getting is we're getting a line that is three squares long. That's important. The three squares is the size of one side of the neighborhood, and that shows up in all the patterns. Trust me, the scaling is, is related to the size of the neighborhood. And so ultimately, this is what that pattern is going to look like in the next iteration, including the red square. The green is the original pattern, the blue is what's going to grow the next time, and the one red square will also grow in the next iteration. Okay, let's show you a radius 3 just to make sure we've got this thing straightened out. Okay, green is what exists right now, blue is what will exist next time, and if you notice, this thing has two kinds of symmetry. I can fold it in half this way, top to bottom. I can fold it in half side to side. So we're only going to do a quarter of it. Okay, here's my neighborhood. The growth rule on this is that it's birth on four. And if you notice, there are four green squares in the bottom of that neighborhood. Okay, so the red target square is going to grow in the next time step. We move the neighborhood. We moved it down like this. Sees the same four squares. Red square will grow in the next time step. Again, you see those same four squares. It's still a radius three neighborhood and that red square is going to grow in the next time step. Now, 
Okay, you still see the same four squares, but doggone, one of them is the target square, and we don't count the target square, so it only sees three. And it's alive anyway. So it's going to stay in the same condition it's in right now and the next time step. Okay? And literally, we take big grids, and that's how the grids calculate it. You go through and you look at every single square as a target square inside whatever neighborhood you've selected and do the calculation. And that's how the cellular topic grows. Okay? Yeah, now, at this point, you're doing uh, no death rule at all? Just yes, no, just there's no death at all in this one. <coughs> now, these guys are, are to look at. We're not going to talk about how they evolve, but they will explain why we want to know about how this thing grows, how these cellular automata grow. This is what we're doing as a result of the stuff that started out at Zizix that I told you about. This is a photograph of, you see the scribbly things in here? Those things are colonies of cyanobacteria, and they are alive. Okay, they're not fossilized, they're alive. Okay, we attempted to model this, and in modeling this, this is what we got, which is something very similar to that kind of pattern. This one was done at five steps, this one was done at 40 steps. And this one has death in it. Yeah, uh, yes. <laughs> yes. It's not the same as what you showed a moment ago. No, but we're going to have death. We're going to show some fractal patterns that have death in them, too. Uh, let me take a pause here and explain that most of the simple cellular automata that were done in here were done with a minimalist viewpoint. We took exactly the minimal number of variables that we could throw into this, which is usually the grid, the neighborhood, and the birth number with no death and use those to try and see what was happening in the first five steps of the cellular automata. The typical way to approach this has been to do many, many steps and take a holistic approach that you have very simple rules that are giving you very complex results at 5,000 iterations. I want to know how it got there. And this is about taking it apart and looking at the first five steps to see if there's something that makes sense about how it grows. That being said, let me show you what the model is for this one. This is a biovermiculation in a cave. The picture is courtesy of Penny Boston, and it shows a white discontinuity in here. Can we model discontinuities? Yeah, we can. And that's also done with cellular atomics. This one is a different kind of biovermiculation, and Penny assures us that pretty much they're unique to the cave. They all look a little bit different. Uh, we attempted to model this, and this was the result that we came out with. Now, these have been published in the previous four papers that Ernesto mentioned. Now, we're going to talk about the nature of growth in cell.